وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين <coughs> so today we continue our series on fasting night prayer and toward spiritual growth in Ramadan and last week uh, we took several different issues and as we said um, the worship of Allah in general fasting in specific uh, at bottom they are uh, spiritual exercises but that doesn't negate uh, the role of the material the physical our bodies and the nuts and bolts of these acts of worship and so we do want to get to the point where we talk about the spiritual side of Ramadan and we will get there uh, but uh, we do have some more nuts and bolts that we have to uh, discuss to make sure that we are fasting in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed so that we earn the reward the spiritual reward and the spiritual benefit uh, that we desire so today uh, we'll look at uh, we'll look at a few uh, more issues that will take us hopefully out of uh, the realm of the nuts and bolts and the first one is the prerequisites for the validity of fasting so if you guys remember last week we talked about um, Allah saying fasting has been prescribed for you and we said that it's been prescribed upon people who check uh, five boxes. So basically, uh, the people who are expected or mandated to fast, you're going to find that the prerequisites for the validity of fasting, there's an intersection between some of those. So some of those are kind of brief, rep there's some repetition there. And then there are a few other things which are um, different from that area. So the first one, the first prerequisite for the validity of fasting is Al-Islam. For a person's fast to be valid or accepted, uh, he or she must be a Muslim. We do that, and this is evidenced by the verse from Surah uh, Tawbah, the ninth chapter of the Quran, verse number 54, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا مَنَعَهُمْ أَن تُقَبَلَ مِنْهُمْ نَفَقَاتُهُمْ إِلَّا أَنْهُمْ كَفَرُوا بِاللَّهِ وَبِرَسُولِهِ It says, uh, nothing prevented their good deeds, in, as, in a sense, specifically, uh, their sadaqat, uh, their uh, charitable offerings. But in general, nothing, nothing prohibited the good deeds of the non-Muslims in general, and specifically the pagans, from being accepted, except that they disbelieved in Allah and His Messenger. So if a person disbelieves in Allah and His Messenger, their deeds won't be accepted by Allah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says, لَإِنْ أَشْرَكْتَ لَيْحْبَطَنَّ عَمَلُكَ وَلَتْكُنَّنَّ مِنْ الْخَاسِرِينَ If you... Uh, associate partners with Allah if you disbelieve in Allah through a shirk then all of your deeds will be nullified and you will be in the hereafter from the losers طيب, the second prerequisite for the validity of fasting is the cessation of menstrual bleeding and this is something agreed upon by the scholars that a woman who is uh, experiencing menstrual bleeding and the third one postpartum bleeding ijma'an aidan also agreed upon by the scholars, then they are not permitted to fast, and if they fasted, that fast would not be valid. We do leave that, and this is evidenced by the hadith, that by Bukhari Muslim, on the authority of Sa'idin, in which the Prophet ﷺ said, أَلَيْسَتِ الْمَرْأَةِ إِذَا حَاضَتْ لَمْ تُصَلِّ وَلَمْ تَصُمْ He said, uh, is it not the case, it is the case, that if a woman is experiencing her menstrual period, then she does not pray, and she does not fast, meaning her prayer and her fasting will not be valid. طيب, so that's one, two, three, Islam, the cessation of menstrual bleeding, and the cessation, the cessation of postpartum bleeding. Number four, at-tamyiz, at-tamyiz. And remember, we're talking about the validity, that in order for a person to fast and have that fast accepted, what are the conditions? And so the fourth condition is a tamyiz. If you remember previously, we said shurut al-wujub. The conditions for obligation was al-bulug, maturity. But that doesn't mean that a non-mature child or person who has a tamyiz, they have discernment, can't fast and be rewarded. So here you see the difference between shurut al-wujub and shurut al 
that shrutul wujub to make it wajib, to make it required, the person would have to be balad. They would have to be mature. They'd have to be pubescent or beyond. But it will be valid for someone who's not pubescent, provided that they have a tanis, they have the ability to discern, the ability to distinguish between right and wrong, and to do right and avoid wrong intentionally, with intent. Uh, that's number four. Number five is al-aql, right-mindedness or lucidity. So that means the ability to form an intention and do things intently. And these two, number four and number five, are evidenced by the ether that we mentioned uh, last week from Ali and Radi Allahu Anhu collected by Bukhari, in which he said, Ama alimta anna al qalama rufi'an thalath. Are you not aware that the pen has been raised for three? Al sabi hatta yudrik, al majnoon hatta yufiq, wa al naim hatta hatta yastiqid. He said, Are you not aware that the pen has been raised for three? I mean, the pen of being held responsible, held accountable. The pen of potentially being punished for your deeds has been lifted for three, the young person, until he reaches puberty. The, um, the person who has mental incapacities until he becomes mentally capable and the person who is asleep until he, until he awakens from sleeping. Uh, so that's number five. And number six, the final prerequisite for the validity of fasting is aniya, intention. So fasting is not valid without the intention for it. And this is bil ijma, And this is supported by uh, the hadith. Collected by Bukhari Muslim, authority of Umar, radiallahu anhu, which the Prophet said, إِنَّمَا الْعَمَلُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مِنْ Manawa actions are but by intentions, and every individual shall be removed. I'm sorry, every individual shall be recompensed for his deeds in accordance with his with his intentions. So, if a person uh, were to awaken early before Salat al-Fajr and feel hungry and eat, and then after that they just go off to work, and they get so busy with work and so preoccupied with their work that they don't have lunch, they don't even drink a sip of water throughout the whole day. They return uh, home exhausted. They go to sleep, they wake up, it's Maghrib. And they say, you know what, I didn't eat all day from Fajr till now. Were they fasting? No, no they weren't fasting because they didn't have what? Yeah. The intention to fast. Boom test. Mm-hmm. So that's one through six. The first one we said was, what is it? Al Islam. Second one, a Tamiz is one of them. But before 10 years, we had two. Menstrual. The cessation of menstrual blood, postpartum bleeding, a 10 years, number four, number five, right mindedness or lucidity. And then last but not least, intention, right? Intention. That's six. The next uh, section that we want to go over is arcanasia, the essential pillars of fasting. Uh, generally speaking, every act of worship has essential pillars. It has those essential elements that without it, you have no act of worship. And an analogy can can be made for this of something like um, a cake. So when you think of a cake, you think of essential ingredients without which you can't have a cake, right? For example, like flour. Can Can you have a cake without flour? Can you make a cake without flour? Nowadays you can. We defer to the sisters. <laughs> okay, so flour is an, a rukin then. Flour would be what? It would be a rukin. It would be a pillar of what? Cake baking. You guys see that? So similarly, now they're, they're back there laughing. I'm asking you guys. I don't think you can make a cake, but I'm not experienced. And I don't think you can make a cake without flour. So it will be... Yeah, you kind of flour. Flour. I didn't say it had to be flour. wheat flour, but I'm flour. It's still flour. You have to have flour. So you have to have <laughs> almond flour or wheat flour or oat flour, but you're going to have to have some type of flour. So that would be a rukin, a pillar of cake baking. Similarly, if you look at a salat. So for example, can you have a salat without a fatiha? No. No, because the Prophet said in the hadith of Abu Baja, he said, La salat liman lam yaqra. There's no prayer for the one who does not recite Al-Fatiha. You guys see that? So similarly, just like uh, there's a rukin for cake baking, there's a rukin for prayer, or arkan, pillars for prayer, there's pillars for asiyah. Without them, you can't have asiyah. 
So what are these pillars? The first one, obviously, is al-imsak, abstinence, to abstain. Means you don't indulge in anything that breaks the fast. We do leave that. This is evidenced by those verses and those hadith which tell us that, hey, the person who's fasting can't do this, can't have this, can't consume that. So, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكُلُوا وَشْرَبُوا حَتَّى يَتَبَيْنْ لُكُمْ الْخَيْطُ الْأَبْيَضْ مِنْ الْخَيْطِ الْأَسْوَدْ مِنْ الْفَجْرِ ثُمَّ أَتِمُّ السِّيَامَ إِلَى الْلَيْلِ So he says, eat and drink until you see clearly the white thread of dawn separate from the black cloak of darkness. ثُمَّ أَتِمُّ السِّيَامِ إِلَى الْلَيْلِ Meaning what? Abstain from these things until what? Until sunset. You guys see that? So we have to abstain from certain things, otherwise we're not, we're not fasting. al uh, The second uh, arkan, or the second rukun, I should say, is an That you have to do, uh, you have to uh, fast with the intention of fasting. You can't abstain and go the whole day without eating and drinking, but never forming an intention and then say, look, today I fasted. Uh, number three, tabi yi means that before the dawn, you have to resolve yourself and commit yourself to fast. And this is something which is specific to the fast of Ramadan. This is something specific to the fast of Ramadan. And this is supported by the ethar, collected by Al-Khamsa, uh, which is Ahmed and the Ashab al-Sunan, the four collectors of the Sunan, on the authority of Ibn Umar and Hafsa, radiallahu anhumah, uh, in which they said, um, in which they said, "Man lam yubiyat al siyam qabla al fajr, fala siyam ala." They said that there is no fast for whoever does not intend to fast before, before the dawn. So it's critically important for us in Ramadan, before every day of starting to fast, that we do what? We resolve to fast. Now, some people say, "Okay, well, uh, go ahead, Saad. Maybe you're going to say it now." Um. If it's not Ramadan, can we, um, uh, do we have to have the intention before Fajr? Uh, no. In, in Ramadan, this is something specific to Ramadan. So if a person was fasting a uh, siyam, which is nefil, it is uh, voluntary, then they can actually form the intention during the day. And this is evidenced by the hadith where the Prophet ﷺ on one occasion, he went to his home and he asked his wives, was there anything to eat? And they said no. And he said, Inni uh, idan sa'in. He said, Then I'm fasting. And this was during the day that he came. So he, Ansha he initiated his intention during the daytime. Okay? So in Ramadan specifically, though, we do have to, we have to have the intention before initiating the siyam and before the day actually starts, which means before Fajr comes in, we have to have that intention. Now, is there something specifically we have to say to demonstrate that we have that intention? No. But basically, we just have to what? Form the intention in our heart. And sometimes there are certain things that we do which are indicative of the fact that we form that intention. So, for example, a husband uh, comes home from Tarawiyah, uh, from the masjid. And he takes out a steak. And he says, I want steak and eggs for breakfast. So when he takes out that steak and puts it on the counter for it to thaw, and tells his wife, I want steak and eggs for suhoor. Okay? And he goes to bed. What does that tell you right there? He, he formed his intention. He formed his intention to fast, and this is what he wants to have for his suhoor, right? Person sets his alarm clock to wake up for suhoor. What does that tell you, right? So these are actions that we do which are indicative of the fact that we have what? The resolve. But we just have to make sure that we're mindful uh, and we don't just uh, kind of mail it in when it comes to what the fasting in Ramadan. We have to fast for Ramadan intently. And so that means every night, we have to what? Have this, this intention to fast the next day. Number four from the Arkan is the timing. That this fasting, this abstaining with niya, or this imsak bi niya, it has to occur in the, in the time frame, which is what? Min al fajr ila ghurub shams. So it has to go, it has to occur from uh, the crack of dawn to sunset, which means a person can't fast until asr. Right? Or they can't start fasting at 9 a.m. and then fast until what? Until sunset. No, they have to fast from dawn until dusk. So those are the four uh, basic pillars, essential pillars of a siyam. Uh, the next section is al-mufattirat. The fast 
breakers. And the fast breakers are not limited. Many people, they'll say, uh, Muslims fast from food, drink, and intimacy. And that's okay if we're, if we're saying that just to kind of summarize, because these are the major fast breakers, but they're not the only ones. It's important for us to know that al-mufattirat, the fast breakers, uh, extend beyond these three. Because if we don't do that, if we're not aware of that, then we may actually fall into these fast breakers without realizing it, thinking that as long as I'm not eating, drinking, or being intimate, then I'm not breaking my fast. So, um, uh, the first one is uh, if menstrual or postpartum bleeding occur. So, if a woman is begins her fast uh, that day because she's not currently experiencing her period, and then that period comes, any time that it comes, immediately her fast is broken. This is agreed upon by the scholars, and we mentioned the hadith of Bisa'id in which the Prophet said, Alayhi the Mar'a. Is it not the case that a woman, when she is on her period, she does not, she neither fasts or prays? And so, let's just say for the sake of argument that uh, Maghrib, it comes in at, uh, let's say it comes in at 8 o'clock. And a woman is fine until about 7.58. And then right at that moment, around 7.58, um, she experiences her period. What happens to that day of fasting? Hmm? Yeah, that, that day is invalidated. As unfortunate as, as that sounds, the minute that it occurs, if it occurs before the thaw, that entire day is now invalidated. Because she broke her fast. It's just like if a person were to eat two minutes before the other. Intentionally. Intentionally. Yes, for some. What if you don't know if it happened before the time or after? What do you mean if you don't know? Like, if you don't know, if, it, if it's 7.59, mm -hmm. and you break fast at 8 o'clock, what? what if you don't know if it hit 8 o'clock after, like right after, or like right before? Are we talking about eating, or are we talking about the other thing that we mentioned? The other one. Uh, the other one, the person should try to determine. Did it happen before or after? And whichever one is more likely, that's what they should go with. Does that make sense? Yeah. So they try to determine which one is more likely. To, is it before or after? Then they go with the more likely one. If there's no way for them to be certain, the best thing to do is err on the side of caution and make up that day. Because the Prophet said, Leave what makes you doubt, for that which does not make you doubt. Tayyip. The second uh, mufattir uh, is apostasy. If a person was Muslim and then they decided to abandon al Islam and stop being Muslim during the daytime, and that day of fasting would be immediately invalidated. And suppose after Maghrib they came to their senses and said, No, I, I can't leave my religion. But at that point they had decided, they had determined that they were going to leave their religion. Then that day now, is an invalid day and now has to be broken up because as soon as they stop being Muslim, their deeds stop being one. Accepted and valid. And we already mentioned the delil for that. Then number three, what if a person during the day of fasting, they basically um, ya'zim al-fitr. The person basically becomes determined to break their fast. Basically, you know, I'm just, I'm not going to fast anymore. Today, I just, I don't feel it. I just think it's too, too hard, it's too hot. I'm just not going to fast anymore. So they basically resolve themselves or determine themselves not to fast anymore. Will that fast continue to be valid? Well, no, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, you, you didn't complete, so yeah. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Would, did? would that, would that um, be, does, be valid? When, when you say they resolve that they're not going to fast, did they have to eat or no? No, they haven't eaten anything yet. Okay. But they've basically determined themselves that I'm not going to eat. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not going to fast. And I'm going to take some things out of the refrigerator and, and heat those up. And once they're heated and plated, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat. So, but they haven't eaten anything yet. But they've desert, determined and resolved themselves. Uh, I think they've broken because they had intention. Hassan, what, what, what did they just do? The niyyah, they did what? 
They broke the niyyah. And what is one of the key pillars of fasting? Intention. The intention to fast. So as soon as you stop intending to fast, you've broken your fast, even if you haven't won, if you haven't eaten anything. Similar to this is what a taraddud fi niyyah. That a person is what? They're non-committal. They're non-committal. So they're like, you know, I I'm going to fast. No, I don't know if I'm going to fast. I'm going to fast. I'm not going to fast. Even that taraddud, even that being non-committal, will also do what? Break your fast. Niyyah is such an important essential part. We have to understand it is a rukin. It's just like a fatiha for salat. As soon as you lose a niyyah, you lose what? You lose a siyah. That's why it's important for us to fast intently. Not to fast habitually. You guys see that? Tayyib, um, which one? Uh, the number four? Yes. Uh, in, in Arabic or English? No, uh, in English. In English, being non committal. Being non committal. Yeah. Tayyib, so that's four so far. The first one we said was uh, menstrual or postpartum bleeding. The second one we said was apostasy. Third one was al azam al fitr that a person basically determines to break their fast. Fourth one is being non committal. Non committal. The number five al qay amdan vomiting intentionally. Vomiting intentionally. Now automatically, if I say vomiting intentionally, that means if you do it unintentionally, does it break your fast? No, no it does not break your fast if you do it unintentionally. And this is something mujma'un ali. This is something the scholars agreed upon. Uh, that if a person vomits intentionally, their fast will be broken. Uh, and this is uh, something which has been confirmed from the statements of Abdullah ibn Umar, in which he said, Man dara'ahu al-qay, fala shay alayhi. Wa man istaqa'a, fa alayhi al-qaba. He said that whoever is overcome by vomiting, he vomits against his own will, vomits involuntarily, then there's nothing upon him, meaning his fast is fine. But if he intentionally vomits, then he has to make up that day. He has to make up, make up that day. So that's number five. Does the reason for intentionally vomiting have to be um, like that? You don't. He doesn't want to fast anymore. It just it no. Regardless of intention, if he intentionally, if he intentionally uh, vomits, then his fast is broken. Uh, number six is cupping. You guys know what? Cupping is in a hijama. Huh? Have you seen it done before? Yeah. MashaAllah. Have you ever had it done before? No. Have you had it done before? MashaAllah. Tayyib, uh, so cupping or bloodletting uh, was a very common medical procedure during the time of the Prophet. And it's something which has become quite popular now uh, among uh, some non Muslims. And obviously, it's still something practiced by the Muslims uh, today. And um, it is not analogous to blood donation. So a person should not think that if I go and donate blood, it's as if what? I got cupped. So donating blood is not a mufattir, but cupping is a mufattir. And cupping, as we said, is like, um, it's bloodletting. It's a it's something which has some medical benefits. And if a person does that, then they have broken their fast. And this is evidenced by uh, the hadith where the Prophet said, وسلم, he said, um, Afr al-hajim wal-mahjum. He said, the one who cupped and the one who got cupped has broken his fast. So they cupping without bloodletting. Hmm? People cup without bloodletting. What, what do you mean, cup you without bloodletting? They, they cup, you know, the same thing, but they don't. The, uh, the on the How do they cup without? You mean cup without drawing blood? Out. Right, right. You're saying they just pull the blood to one spot. Right. I don't think that that's that's the same as cupping though. It's cupping crazy. actually takes out the blood. You have to withdraw the blood. Okay. So there has to be for hijama. Yeah. You have to draw. You have to draw. So there's going to be some 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 incisions made. Um, and I do want to say this is that there is some controversy about whether or not cupping. Uh, breaks your fast or not, and the part of the reason for that for that controversy is because there is an ethical authority of Abbasin, in which he said, and then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam wa huwa sa'im, that the Prophet Sallallahu he got cupped while he was fasting, but Al Bukhari has another riwayah that same hadith, in which he says, "Anhu kana min wajh 
fi ra'sihi. That the Prophet ﷺ got cupped while he was fasting because he had what? He had a severe headache. And so what does that tell you? The Prophet was what? Mariyad. He was ill. فَفَسَدَ سَوْمَهُ لِمَرَضِهِ The Prophet ﷺ, he got treated for his illness and he was in a position where he could what? He was excused or pardoned from fasting. So the original statement of the Prophet is still uh, valid that the one who cups and the one who gets cupped, both of them, their fast is broken. Broken, yes. And what's significant about that, and the reason why we say you can't make an analogy with um, donating blood, is because the Prophet didn't just say the person who's losing blood, but even the person who what? Who draws the blood. And that is totally ta'abudi. Only Allah knows why Allah chose to make that something which invalidates fast, because that person has not lost any blood. Right? Some people would say, well, the person who's getting cupped, he lost blood, that can make him weak, he needs to eat to replenish the nutrients, and so on and so forth. Okay, but what about the one who what? Who drew the blood? Tells you what is completely ta'abudi, Allah just wants it to be like that. And so we have to accept it on its face, and not make an analogy between that and other, and other things, which seem, may appear to seem similar. طيب ثم بعد ذلك from the ah تفضل الله شيخ محمد yes is it the same as drawing blood huh is it the same as drawing blood no cupping is a specific type of drawing blood it's a drawing blood which is intended to be a medical treatment so if you went and donated blood that wouldn't be the same as cupping where they're cupping to what to treat some type of illness or illness and it's just to not to not to digress too much but it it is a science so, for example, they'll cup you in a certain place to relieve sinus congestion. And they'll cup you in a different place to relieve a headache. And they'll cup you in a different place if you have yeah, knee pain or back, back pain. It is a science to it. And it's, 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 uh, it, it is really a medical treatment that there's some people who are experts in it. There are days that you can't cup because your pressure is too high. Exactly. Certain times of the month, it, it's, it's an actual science to it. And so it, it, you can't really make an analogy between that and donating and donating blood. طيب ثم بعد ذلك from the مفطرات the obvious one is food and drink and we mentioned the dalil for that. And last but not least is that which resembles and serves the same purpose as food as food and drink. So that which resembles and serves the same purpose as food as food and drink. So what would that be like? Somebody give me an example of that. Ad fadlay, ha. Gum. Mm, we're going to come to gum. What kind of gum? Any gum. What about the gum like in the, the, uh, the Arabi countries where they, like, they have like this gum that's like, it's like rubber. <laughs> it's like rubber. It has no taste, right? Can you chew that, you think? Yes. No. No flavor. There's nothing that basically dissolves from it and goes down your throat. And it itself doesn't dissolve. Like the gums that we have nowadays, when we go get extra or big red or whatever, that gum gradually does what? It breaks down. And it releases what? Flavor that you, that mixes with your saliva and you swallow it. Okay, we're going to come to that. We're going to come to that. You're getting ahead of me. All right, but let's get to this, because Ahab mentioned the gum thing, and we're going to come to that. But if it's what they call in, in Arabi, they call it ilk. I don't know what, well, in Saudi they call it ilk, right? And it's, like you said, it's, it's not like what we, what we would consider chewing gum. It's almost like something that a person who likes to chew and wants the sensation of chewing, but they don't want to eat anything, they would chew on that. What do you guys think? Is that a mufaktir or ghir mufaktir? What do you think? No. Hmm? It's like chewing on a rubber band. <laughs> like chewing on a rubber band, exactly. <laughs> yeah, as long as you don't swallow it, it, it won't break your fast. We're going to come to that, actually, but... Uh, I just want to mention that. So if some, if some people might, in Ramadan, it might help them get through the day of fasting by having something in their mouth. A person puts a stone in their mouth and sucks on it. What do you guys think? Break your fast, Mopatir? Huh? It, it's it break your fast. To suck on a rock. What do you think? A rock has flavor. <laughs> Dirt. <laughs> if you don't swallow it, as long as there's nothing really on it. If you swallow the dirt, you eat dirt, yeah, that'll break your fast. But if you just suck on a rock, huh? What if you swallow your spit? Why are you getting ahead of me, Hussam? Yeah. What do you mean, the water? 
Well, you, 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 that's the same as I'm talking about uh, brushing teeth. I'm going to come to that. Right. right now. Medicine. Medicine. Okay, but what we're, ta we're talking about things that resemble, resemble food, food and drink. I so, like, for example, Mumtaz, let's say you, so you take something. Okay, so you have different types of things. Medicine, vitamins, IVs, etc. Now, some of these you're going to consume the way you consume food and drink. Is that right? So, for example, you take some supplements or some vitamins or whatever, and you say, well, this isn't food, and you consume it. Anything you put in your mouth that goes into your throat and ultimately reaches your stomach, whether it's good for you or bad for you, whether it will, you know, it will nourish your body or not nourish it, whether it will um, um, make you healthy or make you sick, if you put it in your mouth, it goes in your throat and goes in your stomach, it will break your fast. So in the case of the rock, if you actually swallowed the rock, if you went and you were pumping gas, you're like, man, I'm so thirsty, I'll drink this gasoline, right? <laughs> if you did that and you said, well, it's not food or drink, it will break your fast. If it goes, and if it enters your, 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 your jof, right, in the normal way. Like, suppose you take an injection, and that injection that you get, it does reach your insides. But it doesn't reach your insides. Why? Because they're injecting it in your bloodstream. And it doesn't provide any kakuya. It doesn't provide any strength, any nutrients, any nutrition to your body whatsoever. Would that break your fast? No. 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 If it doesn't, if it enters, if it enters in an other than orthodox way, and it doesn't provide nutrients. See, if it enters... In an orthodox way, it doesn't matter whether it provides, provides nutrients or not. Unorthodox, you got it goes two ways. One, it provides nutrients, it will break your fast. It doesn't provide nutrients, it won't break your fast. Like an insulin shot. So, yeah, insulin. Insulin will not break your fast. No, insulin won't break your fast. Um, I'll give you another example. A vaccine? <sighs> do you think an inhaler will break your fast? Only if, you do um, if you do it, if you do it for flavor in your mouth, it breaks your mouth. But if you, if you do it for, <laughs> <laughs> for this tough seal, I feel like the inhaler itself, um, which is supposed to like basically expand your lungs. When it comes out, there's no jurum. It doesn't come out with any like particles that you swallow. Initially, inside it, it's water. But when it comes out, it comes out as what? As a, as a mist. Okay? And it enters what? Your, your lungs. That will not break your fast. That will not break your fast. The batak. Right? Because it's not what? Because it doesn't what? It doesn't provide any type of nutrients. Okay? And it doesn't have um, any germ. It doesn't have any germ or whatever. But it enters orthodox. Huh? It enters orthodox, but doesn't have any, any germ to it. It doesn't have... It's like air. It's like air. Like you breathe air. Right? Right, and it goes into the lungs as well. So these are the kind of things you have to think about. What about if you take, um, like you get like a vaccine, like uh, what Nasser said, take a vaccine. How about that? No. Yes. Hmm. Why a vaccine? Huh? Does it really? No, it doesn't. And it goes into what? To the bloodstream. Bloodstream, yeah. All right. Ah, tell them. Yes. You have your hand up. Yeah, you have your hand. Um, what if it's a snowstorm and you accidentally swallow some snow? Accidentally. Keyword accidentally. No, accidentally wouldn't 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 have that effect. Alright, so these are some of the things that resemble food and drink and they're things we have to be mindful of. If they if it enters in a way which is orthodox, even if it could harm you and it enters what? Your stomach, through your mouth and your throat, then what? It'll break your fast. If it enters in a way which is not orthodox, it depends. Will it break your fast? I'm sorry, does it provide nutrients or not? If it doesn't, it won't It won't break your fast. All right, let's look at some of the acts which are presumed. Yes? If you drink medicine, will that break your fast? Yeah, if you drink medicine, yes, it will. So let's talk about some of the things which people presume to be fast breakers, but they're not They're not fast breakers. They consider, they consider to be mufattirat, but they're not mufattirat. All right, the first one is um, collecting saliva and swallowing it. So let's say a person 
basically allow saliva to collect in their mouth and then they swallow it. That does not, that does not break your fast. Collecting the saliva and swallowing it. It's makru, it's disliked, it's disapproved of, but it does not break your fast. And it's disapproved with the al madahab al araba number two. What about tasting food? What do you guys think about tasting food? Does it break your fast? No. Women are going to say no, of course, because they have to no, taste no. the food. Because huh? you have to taste the food to make sure it's good. Like, <laughs> you might suck on the rubber gum, even though it tastes like nothing. No, no, it doesn't. No, it's from the it's from the it's from the things that people think it may it may they may think it does, but it doesn't. So, Ibn Abbas, but all it's but it's it's, uh, it's it is it is disapproved of. It's discouraged, but it's not uh, uh, prohibited. And Ibn Abbas, he said, لا بأس للصائم أن يتذوق الطعام القدر. He said, there's no harm if the fasting person tastes the food from the uh, from the pot. So the reason why it's disliked or discouraged is because of the possibility that you might swallow, swallow it, but it itself is not what? It's not prohibited. As long as a person tastes it and spits out what remains, then they have they have not done anything wrong and their fast is, is still is still valid. Uh, and you could make an analogy for this to what? Brushing, brushing your teeth, right? Brushing your teeth. So brushing your teeth is also acceptable as long as you don't swallow one. Swallow the toothpaste, right? As long as you don't swallow the toothpaste. So brushing your teeth is also acceptable, uh, even though some people might consider it uh, a fast breaker. Uh, number three, uh, Ahem helped us with this one. Chewing flavorless gum that is not dissolved is what? Is permitted. Um... How about kissing? Husband kissing his wife? Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Ahmed says, no problem. <laughs> says, go for it. I'm done. <laughs> um, kissing is makru. If, 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 if a person becomes aroused, but it's not prohibited, even in that case. So it's definitely not prohibited if that doesn't happen. And the proof for that is Aisha, she said, The Prophet used to kiss. While he was fasting. So kissing is also something that some people might consider to be uh, impermissible, but it is permitted. Alright, last but not least from the uh, acts that people might consider to be a fast breaker, but they're not, is eating and drinking accidentally. Eating and drinking unintentionally. Eating and drinking out of forgetfulness. Person is goes into like an office building or something, and they're extremely thirsty, right? And they're not paying attention, and they come to crawl, come across a water fountain, and inadvertently they what? They take a drink. And, oh, I'm fasting. Would their fast be broken? No. Their fast would not be broken. Person comes home, and their wife is cooking all kind of good things, and it's maybe like 30 minutes before they thaw. And typically, what they do when they come home and their wife is cooking, they do what? <laughs> they start sampling things, right? That's just their habit. So they come in the house, and they do what they normally would do without. Without thinking, and next thing you know, they're eating something. Oh, I'm fasting. In that, in both of those cases, uh, that person's fast would not be broken. And the proof for that is the hadith collected by Bukhari Muslim, and thought to be Huraira, in which the in which the Prophet said, uh, he said, "Man nasiya wa huwa sa'im, fa akala aw sharib, fal yutim ma sawmahu, fa inna ma atamahu Allahu wa saqa." He said that whoever forgets while fasting and eats or drinks, and let him complete his fast, because it was only Allah. Who fed him and gave him and gave him drink? Ah. Um, so I have an example. Would this consider if the guy is still fasting or not? Mm -hmm. So a guy he 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 wakes up for so he eats. So he's the intention of fasting. Is it's this safe. hypothetical or, or no, no, real no, life? Actually, someone told me about this. Okay, um, I, I'm so, just joking with you. <laughs> <He's> <laughs> you. <laughs> but yeah, um, he he's fasting, but then he forgets that he's fasting for almost like the whole day. He's eating everything. And then he's, he goes to the haram and he sees the doing the ifar, And he remembers that he was fasting. Mm -hmm. Is his fast, did he, like, is it, did he fast or did he like? Ah, uh, you're saying he went the whole day without eating? No, no, he ate. But he, he, all the times he ate, he, he was like not aware that he was fasting. He, he forgot. Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that is included in the hadith, man nasiyah wa He who forgets, he who forgets while he's fasting, so he eats or drinks. So the Prophet didn't say that it, don't, it can only happen once. But as long as he really was, you know, forgetful, then yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so we did 
اه تفضل If I'm not mistaken, if a person were to uh, eat thinking that it was still nighttime, it was not yet Fajr, and then they realize that it is Fajr, that fast is valid. That fast is valid. So if you ate thinking that it was time, that it was a time where you could eat, and then you realize that it wasn't, then that, that fast is still, is still valid. And I think one of the proofs for that is that it happened to the, the, the Prophet's companions that um, it was approaching the time of sunset, and there was rain, there was, it was cloudy, and they thought it had entered, and then they ate, and then the clouds cleared. And they realized that there was a little bit of, of, of daytime left, and that fast was considered valid. The Prophet ﷺ considered that fast valid for them. So we covered uh, the prerequisites for the validity of fasting. We covered uh, Kanasiyam, the... Uh, the pillars of fasting. We covered uh, the mufattirat, uh, the fast breakers, and we covered um, the acts which people generally think uh, break the fast, but they don't. They don't break the fast. But now let's look at uh, something which is which is really important, and that's the recommended acts and best. I'm sorry, recommended acts and best practices and best practices. Or Sunan Asiya. Or Sunan Asiya. Uh, Tafadl, aside you. Huh? Um, can someone fast if it's like not Ramadan? Of course, yeah. Of course. Of course. Yeah, it's recommended. Yeah, of course. It's recommended to fast. In fact, fasting is not something which is specific to Ramadan. But so, his sister, I, I don't want to be rude at all, but I, I really can't focus on anything I'm doing. I was wondering if we could just take the, the take the little lady into the library, maybe. Yeah. So, recommended acts uh, and best practices. So, number one is hastening to break the fast. Hastening to break the fast. And this is something which is agreed upon by the scholars, as mentioned by Ibn Hubayrah. And it's supported by the hadith, said by Bukhari Muslim, on the authority of Sahil ibn Sa'id al Sa'idi, in which the Prophet said, That people will not cease to be in a good state. I mean, they will continue to be in a good state of affairs so long as they hasten to break the fast. So long as they hasten to break. To break the fast. So it's highly recommended that as soon as the time for fast breaking comes in, that we break that we break the fast. But from Ba'dalik, um, the second one is taking the pre-dawn meal or a suhoor. Taking the pre-dawn meal or a suhoor. And this is evidenced by the hadith of Prophet Muslim in which the Prophet said to Saharu, fa in the suhuri baraka. He said, Take the pre-dawn meal, because in this meal there is a blessing. So we are highly recommended in our religion to have some form of freedom meal. It could be something as simple as what? A water. drink of water. It could be a, a handful of dates. It could be anything, but we should have something before we start fasting. And there's a, among the blessings that the Prophet was referencing is taqwiyat al-badan, that it gives you the strength and the fortitude to get through the day of fasting. Number two is when you take the pre-dawn meal, you are purposely being different from the Jews and Christians in the way that they, they fast. As the Prophet said in the Hadith, he said, Faslu ma siyamina wa siyami ahl kitab akalat suhur He said, the thing that distinguishes our fast from the fasting of the Jews and Christians is that we consume the suhur, the pre-dawn meal. Uh, it's also a barakah because we get ajr, we get a reward. You actually get a reward for feeding yourself because you're following what? The sunnah of the Prophet, right? Tayyip. Number three. You had a question, Muhammad? No, no. Okay, okay. Uh, number three 
in addition to having the suhoor, we should delay, delay its consumption. We shouldn't eat it too early in the night, but rather we should eat it as close to al-fajr uh, as possible. As Ibn Hajr said, he said, because it's what? It's ablaq lil maqsood or kamaqal. He said that you, it's, 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 it's closer to what is desired, which is what? For you to be strong. The earlier you eat it, okay? then the less it's going to provide strength during the daytime. So the later you eat it, the better it will be for to get throughout the day. And this is supported by the hadith, Hadith uh, al-Bukhari Muslim, on the authority of Anas, on the authority of Zayd bin Thabit. So Zayd bin Thabit, he said, that we ate suhoor with the Prophet, salam. And Anas asked him, he said, how much time was there between the suhoor and the Adhan. And he said, Qadra Khamsin Ayah. He said, The time it would take to recite 50 verses, to recite just, for example, Surah Amma. Right? Surah Amma would probably take you what? Maybe five minutes? Maybe if you recited really slow? So that means what? The Prophet, relatively close to the Adhan, he would, he would eat the Suhoor. Tayyib. Uh, what else? Uh, another important sunnah of fasting is exerting oneself in the performance of good deeds and acts yeah, of piety. Though, but if you're having a glass of water, right, like mm -hmm. that, you have to finish it. Okay? So does that mean when the adam is coming, you have to finish it? Does that mean it actually it's, it has to be five minutes before? Or like Oh, minutes? no, no, no. no. Well, we were just mm -hmm. showing that it was really close. But you, a person could do 30 minutes before. It might take you that long. So we're, we're just saying that the fact that he said it was 50 ayat between the suhoor and the adhan shows that it was really close to the adhan. It wasn't like midnight. Like somebody... You know what I'm saying, how close to the adhan, right? Hey. Like... Uh, yeah, you, you definitely have to... Because we have to fast from the crack of dawn mm -hmm. till sunset. You're going to have to stop eating and drinking at some point right. before the adhan. You're going to have to. So yeah, if a person stops a minute shy just to be on the safe side, that's fine. We're just saying that it was very close, and that shows that you should delay the suhoor. But not necessarily, you have to, but, you have to basically butt one up, up to the other. That you eat until what? Until you hear the other end. No, you don't do that, because if you did that, you would still be eating at the time when you actually should be fasting. Right? So you're going to have to stop at some point before. But you just don't, what we don't do is make the suhoor extremely early in the evening. Right? A person, for example, gets home from Tarawiyah. Uh, 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, has a suhoor, and then sleeps until fajr. No, what's preferred is that they actually get up and have the suhoor closer to, to fajr. Mm -hmm. uh, Tfadal Muhammad. Yeah, so um, what about, uh, say, the dam is being called, mm -hmm. and you're still eating? Uh, the, uh, there's a hadith to that effect, yeah. but the, the scholars of the early period, um, they say that that hadith if it's accepted, if it's considered authentic, they say that there's no amal, that there's no um, acting by that hadith. And there's, there's a big debate about that. Um, but that's a hadith which, which basically contradicts the fundamental of fasting. Because, just think about it, there's no Baba court, Muhammad, just think about it. If you're eating, let's say you're eating a sandwich, and you hear the event, and you're maybe a third through the sandwich. Mm -hmm. So you mean to tell me you can finish that sandwich, even if it takes another 30 minutes? Your risk. Huh? Your risk. But based upon what, though? Your risk. It's your risk. So, you can, so that means, if, if, we, if we say that, if we say that, Jazakallah khair, my risk, if we say that, that person can actually sit and eat this until until lunch. They could just keep nibbling on it <laughs> until lunchtime. They could. I'm asking you. I'm asking you honestly. They could. They could keep nibbling on it until lunchtime. Hmm? And so this is one of the reasons why the scholars say that they don't accept that hadith, even if it were authentic, and they debate its authenticity. They say that um, there's no amal with that hadith because it contradicts the the asl, the, the fundamental of fasting, the the the, 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 the rukhan. The pillars of fasting. So there's some debate about it, Muhammad, but the safer thing is not to act by that by that hadith. And so a person, if they're not finished with whatever they're eating, I remember, just to, just to show you, I remember when I was studying, just to show you how people will begin to do what? 
يتوسع في هذا. There was a guy who he had a plate of food. Now the hadith says if you have something what? In your hand. He had a plate of food and he was like, yeah, I'm getting ready to finish this. I can finish this. And he was trying to support it with the hadith. This is how what happens too is that acting by this hadith, especially with a weak nafs, is that you start to do what? Twas up, twas up. To the point that a person has a plate of food and they're going to now what? Consume that. That's not what the Prophet even said. طيب, um, all right, number four from the Ahd. Uh, Just put the plate in your hand. Put the plate in your hand, and what somebody might, might do that, and have a plate full of food, and just, and you could eat until the whole. You could just sit there and eat until the whole. All right, so number four from the best practices. What time is the then? Uh, 39. 39, okay, we, we should be to finish. We should be to finish, okay. So um, another best practice is um, exerting oneself in the performance of good deeds and acts of piety. And that's just general for fasting, whether in Ramadan or outside of Ramadan. Um, number five is saying to the one that insults or tries to quarrel with you, saying it out loud in a voice heard by the perpetrator, in Nimrun Sa'in. And this is supported by the hadith in which the Prophet said, إِذَا كَانَ يَوْمُ صَوْمِ أَحَدِكُمْ فَلَا يَرْفُضْ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ وَلَا يَسْخَبْ فَإِنْ شَاتَمُهُ أَحَدٌ أَوْ قَاتَلَ فَلْيَكُنْ إِنِّي إِمْرٌ Sign. He said that if one of you is fasting, then let him not uh, speak um, profanely and let him not um, uh, behave or, or speak in a way or behave in a way which is um, inappropriate. And if someone were to curse him or insult him or try to quarrel with him, let him say, I am I'm fasting or I'm a fasting person, right? I'm observing a fast. Uh, number six. Uh, is a dua. So throughout the day of fasting, the person who is fasting should be making lots of what? Dua. Because the Prophet said that for um, that uh, there is a supplication which is sure to be answered for the one who is for the one who is fasting. And so we should make it a point. This is all supported by the ayah, which Allah inserted in the middle of all the ayat for fasting. He said, he said, if my servants ask about me, I am indeed close to them. I respond to the one who calls upon me when he calls. The scholars of Islam say it's an indication that a big part of fasting is what? A dua, right? Yeah, and reading Quran, and we're going to come to that. Tayyip, uh, one last one is when we break our fast, we are encouraged. One of the best practices is to break your fast with, with dates. And if dates are not available, with water, with water. And this is supported by the hadith of al Khamsa on the authority of Salman bin Amr al Babbi, in which the Prophet said, "Ida afra ahdukum fal yufdir ala tamr, fal lam yajid fal al ma." He said that when one of you breaks his fast, let him break it with a date or with dates and an odd number of dates. And if he does not find dates, then let him break his fast with what? With water. Now, typically, um, many of us, there are certain treats that we like to consume at the time of Hathar uh, in Ramadan and outside of Ramadan. Whether it be sambusa, whether it be this uh, appetizer, whether it be that thing, and so on and so forth. And it's fine to enjoy those things. But when we break our fast, let's break our fast not on one of these things, but on what the Prophet recommended. Why? Because of the reward associated with it. We don't want to miss out on the reward. Start with a date. And then after that, you know... All bets are off. Go, Go ahead. Yeah. Exactly. Go for it. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. We have two questions here. Do you have time for them? Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Let's go ahead and take those. Okay. So um, the one question that I see in the back, come before we get to the sister that just joined, um, the, and I'm not sure if you covered this already, but the question was, if you're taking um, vitamins by IV, what is the fix on it? Yeah, if you're taking vitamins, which will um, provide nutrients to the body, even if you take them intravenously, if you take them by IV, then that will break your fast. And so if there is a medical need uh, to do that, uh, then uh, the sister or the brother who's asking would have the excuse of any marib. Uh If they actually have to take those vitamins for some type of medical condition, 
then they have to look at that medical condition that they're suffering from that requires them to take those vitamins and divide and put themselves in one of two categories. Either this is something which is chronic, something which they will uh, never recover from. Then they are from the people who, for every day of missed fasting, they will feed a poor person. If they're from the people who know I'm taking this medication for a period of time and my body will return to a state where I will no longer need this medication, I'll recover from whatever illness it is that requires me to take these vitamins or these medications intravenously, then that person will just suspend or refrain from fasting while they're taking those medications. And once they stop, uh, they no longer need those medications or recover from the illness, and then they, they would make up whatever days they missed uh, from fasting. So, but if they're taking something which provides takuya, it strengthens the body, or nurtures, um, or provides nutrients to the body, then that case, and then in that case, even if they're taking it intravenously, then that would break the fast, and they, if they're sick and have to take it, then they're from the people who are pardoned or excused uh, from fasting. If that's a chronic illness, then that excuse will be um, perpetual, and they just have to feed a poor person for every day. And if that illness is temporary, then they are excused for the length of the illness. And once that illness ends, then they have to what? They have to fast and make up the days that they miss from fasting. Let me just get them one more because we had so many you know, in person. I'm going to come to you. I'll get you. Um, the question of um, eating um, before um, the fajr, um, I was taught or learned that um, you can eat up until you can see the separation of the light from the night and the dawn of the day. Is, what is, do you know anything on that? Yeah, well, that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran itself. <laughs> Eat and drink until the uh, the thread of dawn uh, separates and becomes apparent from the cloak of darkness. But uh, the problem with that in our setting uh, is that you, you, you can't see that until it's too late. You won't see that. You won't see that. Because of the, you'd have to be in an area where there's no, there's no buildings. And so what we have to rely on is uh, the calculations of the calendars and schedules that we have. And they are approximates, obviously. Uh, but if we were living in a city and we ate and drank until we could actually see dawn, it would be it would already be too late. Because you have to be in a place where there's no buildings blocking the horizon in order to see the white thread of dawn uh, break free from the thread of darkness. And so what we need to, what we have to do, what we're kind of uh, we're kind of forced and compelled to do, is to rely on these schedules and calendars, which yes, they are based upon ishtihad, they are based upon uh, deductive reasoning, uh, but they are good approximates which help us to ensure that we are not eating when we should be fasting. Was it clear, sister? Um, maybe I'm not sure. Um, but I'm sorry, had time to take another question. If you could send it in the back channel, and I can forward it to his email, and then I can send you a reply um, on your back channel. Is that okay? Okay, that's fine. Thank you. All right, so we have one last question from the in-person audience, and we're going to close with that. Um, but I just want to mention um, one last section that we had was just best, best practices in Ramadan. I'll mention just the, the main points, just for your awareness, without the adillah. The first one is incessant reading and reflecting on the Qur'an. And we talked about that extensively, actually, last week, how important it is in the Qur'an to maximize our connection with the Qur'an, our recitation of the Qur'an, listening to the Qur'an, reflecting on the Qur'an, etc. Number two, exerting oneself in acts of benevolence and good deeds in general. Number three, dialing up the intensity of our ritual worship in the last ten days. Number four, actively seeking the night of decree, Laythul Qadr, through the prescribed acts of devotion. Number five, one of as-sunnah al seclusion in the mosques.
to dedicate one's full attention to Allah's worship, what we call it antikaf. And this is something, this is something we can perform uh, if we're permitted and allowed to do in any mosque. And so it's important for us, if we have the time and the ability, to do an itikaf uh, in the mosque. I hope we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, next week when we talk about night prayer. Uh, some of the ahkam. And last but not least, zakat and fitr. Zakat and fitr, which is that special charity that we give in the form of food at the end of Ramadan. Father Nabu Bakr Shah. You sure? Yeah. I'll, All right. Can I take his last question? Uh, go ahead, Habib. Um, I have two, but I'll say the other one. But, um, are you prepared to to make any uh, announcements so far as far as your schedule for Ramadan as far as Monday goes or Friday? Uh, ma mashallah. So what I was thinking, uh, yeah, Juan, is that uh, we would suspend all educational programming during the month of Ramadan except some special Ramadan-specific programming that might be scheduled by the Ramadan committee. So that would mean that in the month of Ramadan we would not have the Monday meeting, uh, and there would be not there would there would be no tafsir for families on Friday in Ramadan. Now, that may change because the Ramadan committee may decide we're going to have X program or Y program associated to Ramadan. But as far as what we're doing on a weekly basis, that would be suspended for the month of Ramadan, and there may be other programs that are scheduled in place of those in a long as best. But so that means that next Monday will be our last. Monday meeting until until after Ramadan, inshallah, if Allah gives us life. Any other, Hamid? Uh, I mean, I don't, we have time. I'll ask one other question. One more. We'll do it real quick, and then we'll do the other. I just want to know: um, in, in some households, how would you suggest going about? You may have four or five different people that have uh, the sahur on their. Apps at different times. Could be right. 15 minutes apart, 20 minutes wow, apart. Wow, 15 minutes. Muslim is kind of closer. Yeah. But sometimes for Fed that I've seen it where it can be as much as 40 minutes apart, hey. depending on what is med have or whatever they have set on their right, cell phone. Right. So, how would you recommend uh, going for that under the same roof? You have people with different settings on their phone. I got you. Um, what I would try to do, and that may not be possible as it come to a consensus, there like you said, there are a lot of schedules out there, but most of them, they follow a similar approach and they have very similar numbers. Not spot on exact, but very similar uh, numbers. Yeah, maybe just a couple of minutes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean 40 minutes. No, 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 I'm not saying there's not oh, some out there. There's <laughs> outliers, but I'm saying there's, there's like, let's say, for example, 80% of them are, like you said, within a minute or two. And then there's a small percentage, like you said, they have uh, kind of numbers which are kind of far off. Those extremities, the extreme ones, I wouldn't give any ibra. I wouldn't give any credence to those. That's the first thing. So now I have these ones are, which are mutaqariba. They're very close to each other. I would say take the safest one for morning and the safest one for the, the night time. So the later time for evening and the earlier time for the fajr. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar.